privilege to be with you again this morning and to look at God's Word together as we examine Revelation chapter 5. To go behind the scenes is a thrilling encounter for any fan. Whether the venue is a concert, sporting event, or the theater, for those with a backstage pass, experience things beyond the purview of the general public and find themselves then in an exclusive company reserved for a select few. Similarly, in the Bible, a divine invitation, a backstage pass, if you will, is occasionally extended to men like Ezekiel and Daniel to go behind the scenes, as it were, in order to witness a divine drama of epic proportions, encompassing both this world and the next. This morning, the scriptures invite us on just such a journey as we turn to the revelation of Jesus Christ, where the Apostle John sets before us heavenly visions communicated in rich symbolism that, while hard to understand, is impossible to forget. Look with me, if you will, at Revelation chapter 5, and we will begin reading at verse 1, and we'll carry it through to verse 10. John writes, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne, with the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb standing, as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. For the setting this morning, as Kevin has already read for us, Revelation chapter 4, you will recall that the Apostle John has been exiled to the island of Patmos. And he's in the spirit on the Lord's Day when he is suddenly caught up into the very throne room of heaven. And he finds himself before a company of angels with the Ancient of Days at the very center. The vision is breathtaking as four living creatures and 24 elders surround God's royal throne and continuously offer praise and worship to the majesty on high. 
And as we then move from chapter 4 into chapter 5, we see that the vision that John received, the scene begins to shift from chapter 4 and the one seated on the throne to chapter 5 and a lamb standing. And John tells us in verse 1, in the midst of this majestic vision of God in all of His glory and majesty and splendor, he says, I saw in the right hand of Him who sat on the throne a book. Literally, the text reads, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book and the picture is apparently one in which the one seated on the throne is holding in an open palm a book or a scroll and in holding the scroll in this fashion he is inviting its opening And notice what John tells us about this book. It's a book that is written inside and on the back. Yes, the contents of this book are full. For the book contains the eternal purposes of God, which are comprehensive and exhaustive. You may recall Jesus said, pertaining to the sparrow that falls to the ground, not one will do so apart from the will of God. And if this is true for sparrows, how much more for the eternal salvation and judgments which God has decreed? Yes, the scroll or the book is full to overflowing. But notice another feature of the book. Not only is it full, but it's sealed up with seven seals. And if the palm that is opened, holding the book, invites its opening, the seven seals warn of its inviolability. This scroll is not to be tampered with, and nothing shall be added or taken away. Its contents are absolutely secure. And they must remain a secret until the time of fulfillment. Notice that the scroll then contains the purposes of God. And at the very center, as we will soon see, of those purposes is the death of the Messiah. That is the centerpiece, if you will, of this scroll. And God desires with the opening of the hand that this scroll be open. But there must be a worthy candidate. And so John begins to tell us then in verse 2 what he saw next. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? Notice that no word from the throne is recorded here. It's as if the angel knows precisely what God wants to have done. He wants a summons issued. He wants a bold proclamation and the angel recognizes this by the simple gesture of the one seated upon the throne holding in an open hand this scroll. Jesus tells us in Matthew 18.10 that there are angels who behold the Father's face constantly, ready to spring into action. And here we have a strong angel Beholding the one who sits upon the throne, and he intuitively knows this king would have this scroll opened. And so he issues the proclamation, who is worthy 
to open the scroll and to break its seals. And you will notice in John's description in verse 2 that this angel is a strong one. And yet despite the angel's power and of course its perfection, for it is a sinless creature that worships before the throne of God day and night. Despite its power and perfection, this angelic being itself is unworthy to open the scroll. And so he urgently and with force heralds his summons. Who is worthy to open this book and to break its seals? And so we see once again that the unparalleled significance of this scroll is being emphasized. For not even a mighty angel who worships in God's presence is worthy to break the seals. Verse 3, And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Yes, an exhaustive search is now made. But none can be found worthy to open the scroll or to break its seals. And we should not be surprised for who could possibly qualify for such a high and holy task if not even a pure and mighty angel in God's royal court will do? And so the situation appears bleak. And the secrets of the scroll, pregnant with the purposes of God, even the eternal purposes of God, remain in suspense. None can be found worthy to open the scroll held in the right hand of Almighty God or to break its seals. And so we then find John's reaction in verse 4. Then I began to weep greatly. You see, John is overwhelmed by the scene and he begins to break under its weight. It's as if John is experiencing sensory overload. And his emotions can bear the dilemma no more. You may recall from Revelation chapter 4, the imagery that John has already seen. He has beheld one seated upon a throne with an emerald rainbow surrounding that throne and before which there is a sea of glass like crystal. And he's heard the rumblings and peals of thunder. And he has seen the strikes of lightning. And he has beheld the seven torches of fire burning before the throne. John has taken in much as God's prophet and seer. And he cannot bear the scene now at this point to find that despite this universal search for one worthy to open the scroll, none can be found. John recognizes that the contents of this scroll must be unrolled and revealed. And yet no one is up to the task. No one is able to answer the call. I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders, verse 5, said to me, Stop weeping. One of the elders, clothed in white garments with a golden crown upon his head, comes to John's assistance and aid. And he seeks to console John. And he begins to redirect John's gaze. And he says to John, stop weeping, John. Behold the lion. John, a worthy candidate has been found. 
The scroll will not remain sealed. And notice what the angel points John's eyes to is the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Now these are Old Testament terms that spoke of the coming Messiah and foreshadowed him. And so John hears that this lion is from the tribe of Judah. You may recall that Jacob's 12 sons were each given a prophecy in Genesis 49. And we are told that it was Judah to whom it was said, From you shall not depart the royal scepter. From the lineage of Judah was to arise Israel's king. And the Messiah. And notice that this lion that is from the tribe of Judah is the root of David. David, of course, was Israel's greatest king. David himself was a Judahite. He was from the tribe of Judah. And so these messianic terms encouraged among Israel hope in a coming messianic king. It would be of the lineage of David and of the tribe of Judah. And so the angel is saying to John, in effect, Behold the lion, the promised Messiah from of old. Now lion, of course, communicates to us strength and power. A lion is an animal that devours and conquers its prey. Yes, the Messiah would come as a conquering lion. And John's eyes are directed to this one who is of the root of David, the Messianic King. And notice what we are told of this one. John writes for us that this lion from the tribe of Judah is the one who has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. Yes, the lion from the tribe of Judah has triumphed. This one has overcome John. This one has won the victory. And therefore, as a conquering king, he is worthy and he alone to take up the scroll and to break its seals. And we are told that it is on the basis of his triumph that he meets these qualifications. And notice the fact that this one has overcome is unqualified by John. It, a, it's, it's a definitive overcoming that is once and for all. This one has overcome forever and ever. And notice what now occurs in verse 6. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing. Having cleared his eyes of the tears, John beholds not a lion, but a lamb. And this for us, brothers and sisters, is the very centerpiece of Revelation chapter 5. Indeed, of the revelation of Scripture. That the one who would conquer is the one who would appear in humiliation. That the one who would overcome would do so through suffering. And that the one who would triumph would do so on the basis of of a sacrificial death. Yes, the lion of the tribe of Judah is in fact a lamb. But notice the details that John provides. This lamb, John says, appeared as if slain. You see, the wounds of this lamb were still visible. And John could see 
that this one had been slaughtered. This one had been killed. Yes, the one who would now take the scroll and was worthy to break its seals had suffered and tasted death. The Messianic King, brothers and sisters, of verse 5, the conquering lion, who is fierce and roars in strength, has in fact defeated his foes through hum humiliation, suffering, and death. And it's important to realize that when John sees this lamb, this lamb is standing. You see, this is not a slaughtered lamb. For the position is not one in which the lamb is lying down. No, the, this lamb is standing. And he has the appearance of being slain. As Jesus reveals in chapter 1, Behold, I died, but I am alive forevermore. And so as John beholds this lamb, he realizes, though this lamb has been slain, he is alive now and will be so forevermore. Recall Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Paul says the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And when John sees this lamb appearing as if it had been slain and slaughtered and yet standing before the throne of God, he recognizes death has been conquered, even the last enemy. Yes, this one has overcome in a definitive way. And this clarifies then for us the meaning of verse 5. For the lion who has overcome, we now understand, has overcome death. And notice that this lamb that is standing before the throne has, as it were, seven horns and seven eyes. And John explains to us the significance of the symbolism, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And so we see, brothers and sisters, the Trinity involved in accomplishing the eternal purposes of God recorded in this scroll. As the Father holds with an open palm this book, and as the Lamb even the Son of God comes now to take the scroll. And He appears as a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes representing the seven spirits of God. And seven in the book of Revelation helps us to understand that it's pointing to completion and fullness. And so what do we have here? But the fullness of the Spirit at rest upon this lamb symbolizing the Lamb's strength. For these are horns, perhaps even the horns of a ram. And seven eyes, which depict the fact that this Lamb searches hearts and minds. Yes, this Lamb is both omnipotent and omniscient. I could not help but think of Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Do you recall the words of the Lamb of God, even Jesus Christ, to His apostles? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit, in all of His fullness, would come upon the witnesses to the Lamb, his apostles, and they would then go out in the power of the Spirit to the ends of the earth, bearing testimony to this gospel pertaining to the Lamb. And what do we see the seven horns and the seven eyes representing? But the fullness of the Spirit 
commissioned to go out into all the earth. With the sheer appearance of the Lamb before the throne of God, it is evident to all that the scroll in His hands belongs there. Nothing more needs to be said. To behold this one, this messianic king who has tasted death, it is evident that he is of infinite worth, for he was slain. He suffered death and is now worthy to take the scroll and break its seals. It's like a babe who has just been given birth by his mom belongs where? No other place but in the mother's arms. In the same way, through the travail of this lamb, this scroll belongs in his hands. And he alone is worthy to open it. Note verse 7. And he came, that is the lamb, and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. This was the Lamb's prerogative and His alone. And what we have here is the transfer of authority. It is now complete. For this book has been given to none other than the Lamb who was slain. Even the Son of God. The Messianic King. And in the transfer of this authority symbolized... In the handing over of the scroll or book to the Lamb, we see that the Lamb now shares the role of sovereign over the entire universe. Remember, Jesus said to one of the churches in Revelation that to the one who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit on my throne. That's the kind of authority the people of God will have. They will sit with Christ on his throne. But he says, even as I have been given authority to sit with my father on his throne. And though it's not mentioned in the text, it appears obvious that this lamb shares now the throne of the living God. The transfer of authority complete. Notice the spontaneous reaction of the angelic beings in this celestial court. Verse 8, when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. The significance of the Lamb's securing of this scroll produces in these angelic beings spontaneous praise as they fall prostrate before the Lamb. And they begin to give expression then to the Lamb's infinite worth. They worship Him. And notice, each one holds a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So the living creatures and elders offer the Lamb both praise and prayer. But what is significant is the prayers that they offer are not their own. No, these are the petitions of God's people. And note that there are many, for these golden bowls are full. Isn't that encouraging to know that what John sees in this vision is the saints of God having faithfully offered up to the Lord Jesus their prayers. And John is assured that those prayers are heard as these angelic beings now present these petitions before the Lamb. And while the prayers and their content is not specified, their essence is surely captured in the words of Jesus Christ as recorded in Matthew 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that is what drove the Apostle John. 
That is why, in part, he wept when no one was found worthy to open the scroll. He longs for the purposes and will of God to be carried out and accomplished in all of their fullness and perfection. And here we have the prayers of the saints being offered before the Lamb. All of this then brings us to verses 9 and 10. Notice what the four living creatures and the 24 elders who function really as heaven's worship leaders. For you find that as the four living creatures offer glory and honor and thanks to the one seated on the throne, the 24 elders then fall down in worship in chapter 4. And in chapter 5, the angels will soon follow the lead of both the living creatures and the 24 elders. And these celestial beings sang, note, they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Notice, they sing a new song. For the Lamb, having been slain, has inaugurated for His people a new covenant that brings with it the finality of the forgiveness of sins. And not only has He inaugurated by His death a new covenant, He has also created, brothers and sisters, a new community. For notice that this Lamb has purchased with His blood men from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. This is the church of the living God, made up of both Jew and Gentile, who have come to trust in Jesus Christ alone for the forgiveness of their sins. And notice, there's a new song because of a new covenant and a new community that has been created by the sacrifice of this Lamb, but also a new status that has been granted to the people of God. For in verse 10 we read that by the Lamb's sacrificial act of death, He has made the people of God a kingdom and priests to our God. That which was promised to the nation of Israel in Exodus 19, that they would be a kingdom and priests, has been fulfilled in the church. You see, all of God's promises, Paul tells us, are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And the people whom He has redeemed, whom He has purchased, are united with Jesus Christ. And the promises made to the people of God in the Old Testament find their consummation and fulfillment in the church. And notice, they have become now a kingdom corporately. And with kingdomship comes the right to rule and reign. And so we read, they will reign upon the earth. And as priests, they are called to offer a sacrifice. But not an animal sacrifice. For the lamb has been slain once and for all. No, they are to offer a sacrifice of praise to the living God, the fruit of lips that do give thanks to His holy name. And so you see the imagery then that is presented before John in this majestic vision, this image of a lamb slaughtered, of a lamb that has been slain. And you and I have the privilege this morning to come before the Lord and to appear at His table and to commune with the living Christ. And the imagery, though, has changed somewhat. For now we have before us bread 
and the fruit of the vine. And these are symbols, much like the symbols in Revelation, that point us to something very significant. For in receiving these elements, brothers and sisters, we proclaim the death of the Lord Jesus until he comes. And so we have before us then the gospel made visible. Yes, we see in the symbolism of the bread, the broken body of our slaughtered lamb. And we see in the symbolism of the cup, the precious blood that he shed to purchase a people from every nation, tongue, and tribe. To be a people of worship who forever proclaim, worthy is the Lamb and worthy is the one seated upon the throne to receive blessing and glory and honor and power 